Greetings to one and all. I welcome you this evening for Professor R. L. Kapoor oration, also a part of the Silver Jubilee celebrations of NIAS. Um, our distinguished speaker this evening is Professor Sudhir Kakar, and uh, who's going to speak on the complementarity of uh, civilizations. I now invite uh, Professor Sudhir Kakar and the chairperson, Professor Malvika Kapoor, to kindly take their seats. Professor Kakar and uh, friends, I am very happy to be here to chair this session. You may wonder why. Uh, that's because usually when they have endowment orations by the families, then the family speaks. When an institute uh, has an oration, it's usually uh, I should be the part of audience. But I'm happy that I have been asked by the director uh, to chair the session because this gives me an opportunity to thank the director and the staff and faculty of NIAS. Uh, the director, who's not here today, but he sends his greetings uh, to the speaker and the audience. He did not know Dr. Aril Kapoor at all. But it's the goodwill of the faculty and the staff who thought that this uh, 25th year of uh, years of NIAS, there should be an oration in Dr. Aril Kapoor's name. So I'm very grateful and I'm happy about having this opportunity to be grateful to NIAS and the director for instituting this award. It was meant to be in the month of uh, June on NIA's Foundation Day, but uh, due to unavoidable circumstances, it got postponed. But hopefully next year it will be on NIA's Foundation Day. And uh, this series of lectures will be as great as the one you're going to listen to today. This also gives me an opportunity to uh, be grateful to Professor Sudhir Kakar because an old friend of Dr. Kapoor, when I brought out his book posthumously, I didn't know which publisher to go to and I requested uh, Professor Kakar to help me. And he just suggested Penguin and told people at Penguin to take this book and it went without review and it the book was out in a year's time thanks to Professor Kakar. So to me, to thank Nias for instituting this award and thank Professor Kakar for doing something really remarkable in getting Dr. Kapoor's book out, posthumous book out. Now, it uh, gives me great pleasure to read his biodata because the circulated one is uh, very brief. Professor Kakar is a psychoanalyst and a writer who lives in Goa. He took his bachelor's degree from Gujarat University, his master's degree uh, from Germany and his doctorate in economics from Vienna. But then he changed the track and became a psychoanalyst trained in Germany. He was a lecturer and professor of, uh, sorry, lecturer. So he trained in psychoanalysis and then he uh, came to India and started practicing. He was a lecturer in general education in Harvard Uni University, research associate in business school, and a professor of organizational behavior in the Indian Institute of Management. Currently, he is a senior Homi Baba fellow, fellow for the Center for Advanced Humanities at the University of Cologne, Germany, and adjunct professor leadership in Fontainebleau, and D.D. Kosambi, a visiting research scholar in Goa University. After returning to India, having practiced as a psychoanalyst, he was also head of the Department of Humanities and Social Science in the Indian Institute of Technology. He, has, uh, he is the 40th anniversary senior, uh, senior fellow at the Center for Study of World Religions at Harvard, a visiting professor at the University of Chicago, McGill, Melbourne, Hawaii, Vienna, and a fellow at the Institute of Advanced Study in Princeton. 
a leading figure in culture, cultural psychology and psychology of religion, as well as a novelist. His uh, person and work have been cited in many magazines and journals, and uh, he has been considered the, one of the 21st important thinkers of 21st century. His many honors include the Cardinal Award for, from, of Columbia University, Boyer Prize for Psychological Anthropology, American Psychological Association, and uh, many other institutions. He has 17 books of nonfiction and four of fiction. And today, he is going to talk about his latest book, which is going to be published sh shortly, on Tagore. So it gives me a great pleasure to invite him to speak in the, on this particular area. And after the oration, I'll be happy if you interact with him and uh, talk to him, but not having a discussion as such once we finish the thing. Thank you. Thank you very much, uh, Mana. Uh, I think I keep sitting to stand for one, one hour. Uh, we'll get a uh, little tiring. And I've noticed that when, if, as the hour progresses, I start talking faster and faster so that I can sit down. So it's better sitting than I talk slowly. Uh, I'm absolutely very honored to give the R.L. Kapoor Ravi's, I'll say, not R.L. Kapoor, uh, oration, the first oration lecture. <clears throat> Ravi was the first person who invited me to Bangalore for a lecture, and that was in 1980. So uh, at that time, he was professor of psychiatry at Nimhans, and I remember coming to Bangalore. That was the first time I came to Bangalore to give a talk. So I'm very glad to be here to give this talk in his memory. Uh, most of you are, of course, here from the National Institute of Advanced Study or, or from Bangalore and are familiar with Ravi's life and time, so I won't go into that. He was certainly associated with the NIAS right from its inception, and I think that he was also the deputy director for well, so when Dr. Ramanna, the founder director, was away in Delhi for five or six years. But uh, more than his institutional affiliations or what he did, he was really that rare breed of psychiatrists who refused to be or refused to remain encased in their professional armor. He, he was interested in classical music and theater had undergone systematic training in yoga, pursued Indian philosophy, and at the last years of his life was vigorously pursuing our traditional ways of dealing with the world, or being in the world, and that in the example of the sadhus and sannyasis in the Himalayas. So when choosing a theme for this talk, I thought it would be to choose a person who in some way, does the same kind of things with very broad interests and India and the West. And I think Ravi was also very much someone who wanted to hold India and the West. There was also another coincidence in the name. Uh, Ravi, Rabindranath Tagore was called Ravi as a young boy, man, Ravi, which means, of course, the sun which shines equally on East and the West. So there is, of course, that commonality in the name part also. <clears throat> so I will start with uh, my talk today on the complementarity of civilizations, which is, uh, of course, as you can see, chosen to be very much against the clash of civilizations. Uh, so Rabindranath Tagore revisited. Uh, so it's not Rabindranath Tagore versus Samuel Harrington, but uh, let us look at this other way of looking at civilizations. So on 20th September 1878, together with his brother Satyendranath, Robi, and I'll call him Robi because he was 16 years old and he was, that's what he was called, sailed for England. He was to stay there for about 16 months. Robi's English sojourn, which marked the beginning of a lifelong exploration 
of another duality in his psyche. I am saying India and West. I am saying another duality because Robi or Rabindranath Tagore was a man of dualities, maternal, paternal, masculine, feminine, home and the world, karebare, spirit and sensuality, which he explored all his life. So this was the exploration of India and the West, which I'll be doing today. And this signaled really also the end of his boyhood. In England, he says, I absorbed within myself the fusion of East and West. In my own heart, I discovered the meaning of my name, as I said, Roby. These are the final sentences of his memoir on his boyhood days. After the first three months spent in the shelter of his brother's family, who had rented a house in Brighton, Rabindranath went to London to begin his law studies. In his first autobiographical writing, he remembers a cruel London wrapped in a mantle of cold loneliness. Knowing no one who lived nearby and unfamiliar with the topography of the city, he would sit for days at the window of his scantily furnished room, gazing at the grey, wintry outside world. He describes the view from the window in words that could equally apply to his inner world of that time. Quote, there was a frown on, his, on its countenance. The sky was turbid, lacking luster like a dead man's eye. Everything seemed turned in upon itself, shunned by the rest of the world. Yet little of this gloom is evident in the 13 letters he wrote back home at this time, many of them to his sister-in-law and muse Kadambri and published in the familiar family periodical Bharati. In these letters, at the beginning of his stay, especially the winter months in London, there are indeed complaints about the weather and, quote, arrested mobility that cloaks everything, the sun that has diminished to a mere hearsay, and where in this land of darkness all my intellect seems to be wasting away. I cannot write so much, so that even composing a letter seems to be beyond me. Only after coming to this country have I fully realized the worth of our mornings and evenings and of our moonlit nights. By the end of his stay, however, the wintry gloom has given way to summary exuberance. In one of his last letters uh, from Torquay, a town in Devonshire, he rhapsodizes over its scenic beauty, riverside fields. He says he has never seen a place as beautiful as this where everything seems to smile. That Jeevan Smriti and Paschatya Brahman remember his England sojourns so differently is not surprising. The memory of a past period of life is not the result of a deliberate weighing of its highs and lows to reach a considered opinion. The selection of remembered events is also dictated by the memoir's present affective state. In case of Chivan Smriti, the memoir, a 50-year-old Rabindranath emerging from a long period of mourning. London was certainly another immersion in loneliness, a condition that haunted Rabindranath during much of his life. Yet what the letters written at the time focus on is not what London denied the 17-year-old Raubi, but what it granted him. The exhilaration of emerging from a familiar cocoon into wonders of a wider world and, above all, the gratification of being admired and found desirable by the opposite sex, thus consolidating a masculine identity that had seemed vulnerable in his latency early teen years. Marked by sharp observations of English life, Full of wit and verb, the travelogue constituted by these letters is a fine piece of writing and remains an exceptionally percipient comparison of Indian and Western mores. What makes the travelogue even more remarkable is that it is penned by a 17-year-old and for me it is a more conclusive evidence of Rabindranath's genius than his early poems. Rabindranath himself was reluctant to publish these letters in the form of a book, which besides its literary value also has the distinction of being the first Bengali book written in the 
colloquial language. He deplores precisely what lends the letters their verve, his youthful audacity, unmindful of political correctness. His reluctance had perhaps also to do with his concern about his legacy. In the 1936 preface to the book, he writes that he is pleased to discover an underlying respect covering the vile profusion of disrespect to which his youthful self was prone. And I quote, This is because I wholeheartedly despise the art of skillful and caustic derision. The capacity to love is God's best gift to mankind. I have never accepted the enticement offered by literature's scandal mongers. If nothing else, this is a fact about me that I would like to leave behind. Rabindranath was impatient with Roby's inclination to bravado. He was also dismissive of 17-year-old Roby's belief, shared by many other in youth, that he was unique. Where he, as he wrote at that time, as a 17-year-old, one has to say, I'm not like the others. There's nothing anywhere that is fit for me to admire. I was then too young, this is the older Rabindranath writing, to realize that this is a sign of poor intellect and proof of foolish immaturity. In Roby's very first letter to his sister-in-law, we see an instance of what Rabindranath finds galling in his younger self, landing in Brindisi in Italy and stepping on European soil for the first time, Roby writes to her. You are aware of my imaginative nature. I had thought a marvelous sight would open up in front of my eyes as soon as I reach Europe. This must remain in my fantasies and can never be expressed in words. But I have seen since childhood that reality and imagination rarely match. I am unable, due to a flaw in my nature, to fully experience many things. Before arriving in a new country, I imagine its newness in such a way that once I am there, it does not seem new anymore. Before seeing any grand spectacle, I imagine it to be so grand that in reality it does not seem grand anymore. That Europe did not seem so novel to me made everyone speechless. But very soon, the authentic face of a wide-eyed youth emerges from the put-on mask of an all-knowing adult. On the train journey from Brindisi to Paris, Roby enthuses over the beautiful landscape, like a poet's dream, he calls it, with its marvelous vineyards, mountains, rivers, lakes, cottages, tiny villages. It was it was as if we were reading poetry all the way. By the end of his stay, and especially after living for a few months as a boarder with Dr. Scott and his family, whose two young daughters promptly fell in love with him, a much more confident Roby is voicing unabashed admiration for aspects of Western culture which he would dearly want his countrymen to possess. The lack of servility in the servants, the respect for talent, and above all, certain features of family life and the high place of women in social life. From the passion and the length of his, of his complaints on the shortcomings of the Indian family, it is apparent that the West has become his ally in voicing some of his own discontents while growing up in the extended Tagore family. I quote from the letters, We do not give the name of servitude to slavery within the family. But we call at the most, we, but we can at the most gild it with a name and transform the iron fetters of discipline into those of gold, but cannot erase its restrictions. The harmful effects persist. I had once thought that Hindus were by nature simple and spontaneous, without any unnatural restrictive laws. But I am ashamed to say that any more. Hindus without unnatural laws just peep into their families. Just look at the rigidity rigidity between brother and sister, mother and father, men and women. It is even forbidden for one to talk too much or even laugh in front of one's elders. How terrible! If you cannot talk freely to those with whom you spend 24 hours of the day, cannot laugh heartily, if in their presence you have to rein your tongue, tongue in, place a weight on your happy countenance and wear a mask of reverence the, life, the livelong day, where then do you go for your relaxation? English homes have a feeling of cheerful relaxation. Parents, brothers and sisters, wives and sons gather around the fireplace and cheer lit it up 
with their happy talk, laughter and singing. After a day's hard work, one returns home to a sense of joy and familiarity. In India, in one room, the father-in-law, along with his clutch of elderly friends, sits drawing on their hookah and blames today's generation and its unholy behavior for the impending onset of divine recrimination. In another room sits the bride of the house, a veil drawn over her face, silently listening to her mother-in-law ladling out to her her daily dose of blame. In another room, her husband, along with his young friends, gossip maliciously. No one in England could imagine such a scenario. Our freedom of speech is with other people. In our families, we have to make strangers our own because our own are strangers to us. And in his praise of middle-class English women who play an active part in Western social life, we hear echoes of his frustrations around the confinement of women in the Andar Mahal of the Tagore Mansion in Calcutta. <coughs> Quote again, These English women are not confined to the house. They converse with friends and at meetings when superior matters are discussed, they listen and may voice their own opinions. In the presence of people, a very happy and pleased expression is presented. Although she herself may not be witty, she enjoys a good joke, is generous with her praise if there is something she likes, and laughs heartily if she has something amusing. It is not ideal behavior for women here to keep their lips sealed or to be overcome with shyness. A bit of reticence is not unpleasing to the eye. One may even see some poetic sweetness in it. But to deal with shyness the livelong day is painful indeed. If one is rewarded with an answer to one's question after two or three hours of perseverance, one can bear it once. But if one is brought to the brink of exhaustion each day in trying to get her to say a few words, it would then be difficult to survive. If you cannot share a joke with me without inhibition, I would be forced to disassociate myself from you and look for other company. The mantras chanted at the wedding ceremony will not magically give rise to love. Marriage by itself does not lead to love. If no love exists between my wife and I, and furthermore, if my wife cannot keep me entertained with lively conversation, will I not look for sources of amusement elsewhere, leaving my mute lady companion behind? <clears throat> I can imagine the consternation with which such sentiments were received by the Tagore family. Commenting on similar advocacy of a freer intercourse between the sexes in Ravi's next letter, Dwejinder Nath, the oldest brother and editor of the family journal Bharati, observed, women can never share with men the kind of conversation they have with friends of their own sex in the inner recesses of the house. The presence of a man in their midst would only mar their enjoyment. This is why the outer parts of the houses have been created for men to gather together and converse in, and the inner recesses for women. If you were to ask where is the harm in opposite sexes eating for a friendly exchange, the answer would be that gradually it would evolve that friendship between males and that between females would be termed as inferior and glances exchanged between friends of the opposite sexes would be termed as a superior friendship. It's proof being the way the hearts of European women leap at the prospect of dancing with men at balls. Alarmed at Roby's radical questioning of family and social values, and coupled with the fact that he was not making any headway in his law studies, Debindranath decreed that Roby returned on the same ship that was bringing his brother's family back to India. Rabindranath never lost his attraction for the West and what it gave him. A quickening of the mind in the company of other searching and alive minds who appreciated what he had to offer. The West never became his world. Yet he remained grateful for the gift of acceptance and love he had received from it. In October 1913, he writes to C.F. Andrews, one of his closest friends, In India, the range of our lives is narrow and discontinuous. That is the reason why our minds are beset with provincialism. And from London in July 1920, When I am in the West, I feel more strongly than ever I am received in a living world of mind. I miss here my sky and light and leisure, but I am in touch with those who feel and express their need of me and whom I can offer myself. Our span of life is short and opportunity rare. 
So let us sow our seeds of thought where soil claims them, where the harvest will ripen. As with the influential art historian Ananda Kumara Swami and Mahatma Gandhi, it was the long and essential exposure to the West that enabled Rabindranath to make a seminal contributions to the dialogue of civilization. Rabindranath believed that the East-West encounter initiated by colonialism had so far been confined to the surface. In spite of its terrible violence and inequities, he professed to discern at the heart of this encounter the coming to together of the ideas of the West and India. My India is an idea and not a geographical expression, as he was to say. The idea of India is actually Rabindranath Tagore's phrase. <clears throat> seeds that would germinate and mature in great future union. Roby's stay in England was to initiate a lifelong preoccupation with the duality of India, or later more generally the East and the West. His observations on India's encounter with the West, its consequences and its ideal outcome remain unsurpassed in depth of insight. In his reflections on this encounter, Rabindranath was incisive on the disquiets afflicting both the Indian and Western civilizations, disquiets which have become raging discontents in our own times. At the outset, let me first say that I am in substantial agreement with Rabindranath in positing an Indian civilization that has features which distinguish it from Western civilization. The main river in Indian culture, Tagore says, has flowed in four streams, the Vedic, the Puranic, the Buddhist, and Jain. And I'm quoting him, it has its source in the heights of the Indian consciousness, but a river belonging to a country is not fed by its own waters alone. The Mohammedan, for example, has repeatedly come to India from outside, laden with his own stories of stores of knowledge and feeling and his wonderful religious democracy bringing fresh cyst after fresh it to sw swell the current. To our music, our architecture, our pictorial art, our literature, the Mohammedans have made their permanent and precious contributions. Those who have studied the lives and writings of our medieval saints and all the great religious movements that sprang up in the time of Mohammedan rule know how deep is our debt to this foreign current that has so intimately mingled with our life. Then there are the other currents, the Sikh, the Zoroastrian, the Christian, but also the Chinese, Japanese and Tibetan, for India did not remain isolated. I quote him again, side by side with them must finally be placed the Western culture, for only then shall we be able to assimilate this last contribution to our common stock. A river flowing within banks is truly our own and it can contain its due tributaries, but our relation with the flood can only prove disastrous. <clears throat> Rabindranath believes, as I do, in the existence of an overarching Indian identity in spite of many surface differences, which have perhaps been magnified by the discipline of social anthropology that by its very nature is, is attuned to look at individual trees rather than espying the pattern of the forest. Rabindranath, of course, writes of this much more eloquently than I ever could. <clears throat> Quote again, the bringing about of an intellectual unity in India is, I am told, difficult to the verge of impossibility owing to the fact that India has so many different languages. Such a statement is as, unreable, as unreasonable as to say that man, because he has diversity of limbs, should find it impossible to realize life's unity, that only an earthworm composed of a tail and nothing else could truly know that it had a body. He then goes on to compare India with Europe, which has a common civilization with an intellectual unity, which is not based on uniformity. <clears throat> what is the defining feature of Indian civilization according to Tagore, whose loss is responsible for much of its contemporary disquiet? And I use the word contemporary deliberately for both Tagore's and our own times, since the situation if it has changed in the last 100 years, has done so only for the worse. 
the defining feature of Indian civilization, according to Tagore, which we are in the process of losing, is sympathy. Sympathy, as I understand it, is the feeling of kinship that extends to beyond what is our kin, a sense of we that extends beyond kinship. And this feeling of kinship is not limited to human beings, but extends to the natural world. Here, Tagore and Gandhi are in complete agreement. Brotherhood, Gandhi writes in one letter, is just now a distant aspiration. To me, it is a test of true spirituality. All our prayers and observances are empty nothings, so long as we do not feel a live kinship with all life. To one of his many critics, and there were many throughout his life and even after his death, who wrote to him suggesting that violence is the law of nature and that man is animal first and human afterwards, Gandhi replies that man can be classed as animal only so long as he retains his humanity and goes on to say, the correspondent apologizes for suggesting that I might regard myself as a remote cousin of the ape. The truth is that my ethics not only permit me to claim but require me to own kinship with not merely the ape but the horse and the sheep, the lion and the leopard, the snake and the scorpion. The hard ethics which rule my life and I hold ought to rule that of every man and woman, impose this unilateral obligation upon us. For Rabindranath, in contrast to the West, Indian civilization sought to establish a relationship with the world, with nature as also with living beings, not through the cultivation of power, but the fostering of sympathy. I quote him, when we know this world as alien to us, then its mechanical aspect takes prominence in our mind. And then we set up our machines and our methods to deal with it and make as much profit as our knowledge of its mechanism allows us to do so. This view of things does not play us false. This aspect of truth cannot be ignored. It has to be known and mastered. Europe has done so and reaped a rich harvest. For us, the highest purpose of this world is not merely living in it, knowing it, and making use of it, but realizing our own selves in it through expansion of our sympathy. Not alienating ourselves from it and dominating it, but comprehending and uniting it with ourselves in perfect union. In a letter to Andrews, Rabindranath articulates the ideas of India and the West through what I would call an origins myth. He says, from the beginning of their history, the Western races have had to deal with nature as their antagonist. This fact has emphasized in their mind the dualistic aspect of truth, the eternal conflict between good and evil. Thus, West has kept up the spirit of fight in the heart of their civilization. They seek victory and cultivate power. The environment in which the Aryan immigrants found themselves in India was that of the forest. The forest, unlike the desert or rock or sea, is living. It gives shelter and nourishment to life. In such surroundings, the ancient forest dwellers of India realized the spirit of harmony with the universe and emphasized in their mind the monistic aspect of truth. They sought the realization of their soul through the union with all. The spirit of fight and the spirit of harmony both have their importance in the scheme of things. For making a musical instrument, the obduracy of materials has to be forced to yield to the purpose of the instrument maker. But music itself is a revelation of beauty. It is not an outcome of fight. It springs from an inner realization of harmony. The musical instrument and music both have their utmost importance for humanity. The civilization that conquers for man and the civilization that realizes for him the fundamental unity in the depth of existence are complementary to each other. When they join hands, human nature finds its balance and its pursuits through their rugged paths attain their ultimate meaning in an ideal of perfection. <clears throat> the ideas of two civilizations when articulated through history have picked up dross and it is now through the distortions and perversions of their core ideas that the civilizations encounter each other. If the caste idea and the suffering of the excluded 
is an Indian distortion than the perversion of Western idea of a conquest of nature with its marvelous training of intellect is the passion for wealth and power. This passion has not only science as its ally, but also such forces as nation worship and idealization of organized selfishness. Nationalism for Rabindranath was collective selfishness, collective narcissism, deeply inimical to the idea of sympathy. Rabindranath is prophetic when he talks of the passion for wealth. He says, the whole of the human world throughout its length and breadth has felt the gravitational pull of a giant planet of greed with concentric rings of innumerable satellites causing in our society a marked deviation from the moral orbit. A person, whether in the West or East, who has unreservedly embraced the idea of the West together with its cult of power and idolatry of money has, in his words, in a great measure reverted to his primitive barbarism a barbarism whose path is lit by the lurid light of intellect. For barbarism is the simplicity of a superficial life. It may be bewildering in its surface adornments and complexities, but it lacks the ideal to impart to it the depth of moral responsibility. The future combination of the ideas of West and India could not come to fruition as long as the relationship between the two remained that of the victor and vanquished, the giver and the receiver. A realization of the complementarity of the two ideas required that Indians first became aware of their heritage, of the spirit or mind of India. Yeah, to quote him again, once upon a time we were in possession of such a thing as our own mind in India. It was living, it thought, it felt, it expressed itself. The wholesale acceptance of modern Western education has suppressed this mind. It has been treated like a wooden library shelf to be loaded with volumes of second-hand information. In consequence, it has lost its own color and character and has borrowed polish from the carpenter's shop. We have bought our spectacles at the expense of our eyesight. And further, if we were to take it for granted what some people maintain, that Western culture is the only source of light for our mind, then it would be like depending for daybreak upon some star, which is the sun of a far distant sphere. The star may give us light, but not the day. It may give us direction in our voyage of exploration, but it can never open the full view of truth before our eyes. In fact, we can never use this cold starlight for stirring the sap in our branches and giving color and bloom to our life. Language is an important part what stirs the sap, gives color and bloom to our lives. Tagore's argument for the mother tongue as the medium of a child's instruction at the primary level remains as incisive today as it was then and needs to be widely disseminated when the demand for schooling in English from the primary level onward is raised, being raised by parents in many parts of India. And I quote him here, from his, this is from his autobiography. It was because we were taught in our own language that our minds quickened. Learning should as far as possible follow the process of eating. When the taste begins from the first bite, the stomach is awakened to its function before it is loaded, so that its digestive juices get full play. Nothing like this happens, however, when a Bengali boy is taught in English. The first bite bids fair to wrench loose both rows of teeth, like an earthquake in the mouth. And by the time he discovers that the morsel is not of the genus stone but a digestible bonbon, half his allotted span of life is over. While one is choking and spluttering over the spelling and grammar, the inside remains starved. And when at length the taste comes through, the appetite has vanished. If the whole mind is not functioning from the beginning, its full powers remain undeveloped to the end. While all around was the cry for English teaching, my third brother was brave enough to keep us to our Bengali course. To him in heaven, my grateful reverence. As a poet, Rabindranath is alive to the danger of what is called operational thinking, that is, verbal expressions lacking associational links with feelings, symbols, and memories. 
if the early education has been in an alien language. One's mother tongue, the language of one's childhood, is intimately linked with emotionally colored sensory motor experiences and however grammatically correct and rich the vocabulary of its user, the alien language will suffer from an emotional poverty that is generally fatal to the enterprise of poetry. For Rabindranath then, without a revival of the idea of India, of an Indianness or Indian identity in modern parlance, India will allow her priceless inheritance to crumble into dust and trying to replace it clumsily with feeble imitations of the West, make herself superfluous, cheap and ludicrous. That is his quote. Such a fate may not be looked at with equanimity. In a globalized world that links not only entertainment and capital flows, but also ideas, the bankruptcy of the East will also have an impact on Western mind, make it poorer. To adapt his words, if the great light of culture becomes extinct in the East, the horizon in the West will mourn in darkness. Rabindranath was not a defensive and regressive repudiation of Western culture. You quote him again. Let me say that I have no distrust of any culture because of its foreign character. On the contrary, I believe that the shock of such extraneous forces is necessary for the vitality of our intellectual nature. The European culture has come to us not only with knowledge, but with its velocity. Then again, let us admit that modern science is Europe's great gift to humanity for all time to come. We in India must claim it from our hands and gratefully accept it to be saved from the curse of futility by lagging behind. We shall fail to reap the harvest of the present age if we delay. <clears throat> what Rabindranath objected to was the disproportional space Western ideas and worldview occupied in the modern Indian mind and thus killed or hampered the opportunity to create a new combination of truths. I quote him, it is this which makes me urge that all the elements in our own culture have to be strengthened, not to resist the Western culture, but truly accept and assimilate it, to use it for our sustenance, not as our burden, to get mastery over this culture and not to live on its outskirts as the hewers of texts and drawers of book learning. Unlike Gandhi, Rabindranath welcomed modern science and Western forms of knowledge. He admired the fullness of intellectual vigor in the West that is working towards the solution of problems of life. What he bemoans is that the mental vitality of modern forms of knowledge are not balanced by the Indian idea of the cultivation of sympathy. Sympathy, as I understand it, is the highest manifestation of the human soul. It is a continuum of loving connectedness to nature, art, visions of philosophy or science, living creatures, and of course to other human beings. For some, it is in the moments of connectedness with the world, its signs, sights, sounds, smells, the radiance of its days and the darkness of its nights, the sap of its trees and plants, and the joys and sufferings of its living beings when they sense and surrender to the spontaneity of sympathy. For others, sympathy is sensed in feeling of deep connectedness in presence of great art, in the solemnity of sacred spaces, or even glimpsed in the aftermath of the sexual embrace when the bodies have separated and are lying together side by side, but are not yet two in their responses. It is in such moments that we sense sympathy as a hidden power in ourselves that is not self-centered and is a source of our highest self. These are moments of quiet exaltation that come from, from the flow of connectedness, from communion, to be sharply differentiated from the gratifying boost given by the feeling of power that comes from understanding the world. Personally, I fully subscribe to Tego's view that all our poetry, philosophy, science, literature, art, religion, society and politics serve or ought to serve to widen the range of our kinship, our sympathy, the principle of the soul. Initiated in our love for those who nurtured us when we were children and our own love for, for our children 
friends, lovers as we get older, it is only the wider and wider manifestations of sympathy that are the true measure of human progress. Initiated, <clears throat> the soul is insignificant as long as it is imprisoned within an individual self. It reveals its significance and its joy only in connectedness. The more vigorous our individuality, the less the need to encase the individual self in an armor of self-centeredness and more the capacity to make it permeable and thus participate in the play of the soul. To me, the question of the fate of the soul after death, central for our religions, is not especially interesting. If we do not free the soul from its prison of individual self, guarded by warders of self-centeredness while alive, I doubt whether there is hope of its freedom, of its salvation after death. To adapt Robert Frost's observation on love, the earth is the only place for the soul. I don't know where it is likely to get better. How would the cultivation of soul, of sympathy, the defining idea of Indian civilization, work out in practice? Let me take a few examples. Modern psychology, Western in its orientation, has made great advances in uncovering the mysteries of the human mind, the complexity of the human psyche. The truths it has arrived at, valuable as they are, are however partial truths. They largely look at human beings from two angles. The first is that the person is a body, a brain-mind entity in psychological terms, and thus seek to understand psyche through psychologies that derive from biology. The brain-mind school enjoys considerable vogue in contemporary psychology. The other focus of psychology is interpersonal, that is, psyche is understood as a product of experiences, beginning with the family, with the person's social groups. As I said, I have no quarrel with the proposition that lies at the heart of modern psychology, that at every moment of his being, a person is a part of his bodily and social orders. What I would like to add is a dimension that I find largely missing from West-inspired psychology, that a person is not only a part of his bodily and social orders, but also of a cosmic order. What I'm saying is that if we want to progress further in understanding human mind and behavior, then besides the soma, the body, and, and the police, the social order, we need to take into account and focus on another partial truth, the cosmos. Cosmos, as I visualize it, has two aspects, one subtle and the other, well, earthy. The subtle aspect of the cosmos is the spiritual order, which has been variously conceptualized by different cultures at various times of history as animated by gods, ancestral spirits, demonic beings, or in most of sophisticated formulations as God, universal spirit, or simply the sacred. The earthy aspect of cosmos is the environment in which we are born and live our lives. Though a few psychologists have sought to link psychological processes with the spiritual order, a systemic study of the effect of the environment, nature of terrain, quality of air, sunlight, birds, animals, trees and flowers, seasons, and so on, on human development, cognition, and mental health has still to be initiated, an area of psychology that naturally evolves from and is uniquely suited to the idea of India. <clears throat> Let me take another ex hypothetical example, this time from psychotherapy. The treatment of a patient suffering from anhedonia which is a condition where one finds no pleasure in any activity, however intrinsically pleasurable the activity may be. In a psychotherapy imbued with the idea of India, the therapeutic goal will not only be a restoration of sexual pleasure, but a restoration that takes place under the guiding star of loving intimacy, the form of sympathy in this context, which transforms the sex into a thing of beauty. In Indian psychotherapy, the pleasure of eating will not be restored only for itself, but under the star of fellowship, the form of sympathy in this particular context, which turns even a simple meal into a feast, a celebration of solidarity with others who share it. 
Similarly, Rabindranath's vision would also raise questions about literature. Have we sufficiently explored the basic assumptions that lie behind Western theories of literary criticism and judgments of literary worth, which we use in the teaching of literature in our Indian universities? Do they need to be balanced or at least looked at from the angle of empathy, which following Rabindranath, I have postulated as the defining feature of Indian civilization, the idea of India. A hint of the possibilities is again provided by Rabindranath in his remarks on Shakespeare, who he greatly admired, and Kalidasa, who he revered. And I quote him, the fury of passion in two of Shakespeare's youthful poems is exhibited in conspicuous isolation. It is snatched away, naked, from the context of the all. It has not the green earth or the blue sky around it. It is there ready to bring to our view the raging fever which is in man's desires and not the balm of health and repose which encircles it in the universe. As I understand him, the Indian literary criticism will pay as much attention to the movement of sympathy in a work of literature as following Western Cus canons it does to the movement of passions. The characters in the Hindi writer Premchand's fiction, or for that matter, Rabindranath's, for example, may not plumb the depth of human passions, a shortcoming that from the Indian point of view is relieved and compensated by the exquisite movement of sympathy that characterizes the best of their works. The highest accolades will of course be reserved for literary works that combine both the movements. For me, some of Tolstoy's ram Tolstoy's writings come immediately to mind. Social movements in service of justice for the weak and the oppressed are rapidly picking up pace in our country, shaking traditional hierarchies and power structures. This is a welcome development. Most of these movements, however, seem to operate on the basis of only one ethic, justice, which is related to the issue of power, of correcting skewing, skewed and unfair power relations. In an almost sacralized ethic of justice, what matters is the outcome, not the path. Thus, there have been eloquent voices that have defended violence in service of justice. In her reflections on violence, the philosopher Hannah Arendt writes, under certain circumstances, violence, which is to act without argument or speech and, and without reckoning with consequences, is the only possibility of setting the scales of justice right again. In this sense, rage and violence that sometimes, not always, goes with it belong to the natural emotions. And to cure man of them would mean nothing less than to dehumanize or emasculate him. I believe that the Indian ethic of sympathy, compassion in this context, must temper the quest for justice. In our quest to right or wrong, bring the ethic of justice to the forefront, we are in danger of losing sight of, both, of what both Gandhi and Rabindranath held was the defining characteristic of Indian civilization. In Rabindranath's words, creative force needed for the true union in human society is love. Justice is only an accompaniment to it, like the beating of Tom Tom to song. Tagore's creation of the university in Shantiniketan in the 1920s then sprang from this vision of India, an Indian university in which Indian cultures would be represented in all their variety, a university that would give new life to the idea of India. He soon realized that actually his mission was much broader. Indeed, it was the mission of the present age, a meeting of East and West that would bear new fruit for humanity. Shanti Niketan would bring forth its fullness of flower and fruit only if through Rabindranath it also sent its roots to the western soil. At a time for, of struggle for freedom from western colonial domination, a time when Gandhi's call of non-cooperation with the British was loud, Rabindranath's vision of a harmony between ideas of east and west for the creation of a universal man had few takers. He was accused by some of staying apart from the national struggle even of toading to the British, accusations that caused him deep anguish. Writing to Andrews about his forthcoming travel to Europe at a time when Gandhi's movement of non-cooperation with the Raj 
had captured the country's imagination, he says, Personally, I do not think my overcautious doctor was wise in holding me back. He does not fully realize how great is the mental strain that my stay in India imposes upon me. It is the moral loneliness which is a constant and invisible burden that oppresses me most. I wish it were possible for me to join hands with Mahatma Gandhi and thus at once surrender myself to the current of popular approbation. But I can no longer hide it from myself that we are radically different in our apprehension and pursuit of truth. Today to disagree with Mahatma and yet find rest in one's surroundings in India is not possible and therefore I'm waiting for my escape next March with an impatient feeling of longing. I know I have friends in Europe who are my real kindred and whose sympathy will act as a true restorative in my present state of weariness. It was not as if Rabindranath did not admire Gandhi. In the beginning, he may have called Gandhi a moral tyrant, who in context of life in his newly established Sabarmati ashram had the power to make his ideas on celibacy, food and so on, prevail through strict obedience, through slavery rather than freedom. Later though, it was precisely the lived morality of Gandhi's life that insisted on following truth. As the Mahatma saw it at the moment, his moral power, which evoked Rabindranath's respect and admiration. Where he continued to differ from Gandhi was in their attitudes towards the West. Unlike a young Gandhi's vehement denunciation of Western civilization in his Hind Swaraj, Rabindranath only rejected the deformations in the ideas of the West that came to India, all plan and purpose as he called them, with the shock of passion and without any humanity. Writing in the wake of the Jallianwal Bagh massacre in Amritsar, where, in which British troops fired on unarmed protesters, killing hundreds, an event that pro prompted Gandhi to start a civil disobedience movement and Tagore to return his knighthood to the British crown, he states his difference with Gandhi clearly. Stung by insult or injustice, we try to repudiate Europe, but by doing it, we insult ourselves. Let us have the dignity not to quarrel or retaliate not to pay back in smallness with being small ourselves. What Gandhi is inculcating in his pugnacious spirit of resentment in the letter Revenge is crossed out is the withdrawal of service from the government. It is a wasteful diversion of the best part of, an, of our energy to a course which ends in a mere emptiness of negation. This is the time when we should de dedicate all our resources of emotion, thought and character to the service of our country in a positive direction. The moral fervor which the life of Gandhi represents and which he, of all other men in the world, can call up is needed. That such a precious treasure of power should be put into the means and frail vessel of our politics, allowing it to sail across endless waves of angry recrimination is terribly unfortunate for our country, where our mission is to revive the dead with the fire of the soul. It is not that I do not feel anger in my heart, for injustice and insult heaped upon my motherland. But this anger of mine should be turned into the fire of love. India can live and grow by spreading abroad, not the political India, but the ideal India. Our Shanti Niketan is for this mission. We must fully allow this ideal India, and then will come time when we shall be able to carry her abroad, and once again, her history will find fulfillment in the present age. The vision of harmony of East and West that had been vouchsafed to him as an 18-year-old in England, the discovery of the meaning of his name, Roby, and the mission it imposed upon him were to stay with Roby till the end of his life. Thank you. Thank you, Professor Kakar, for a splendid spellbinding oration with the main theme being sympathy or the absence of it, as the core of uh, both the cultures that he was talking about. I request Lakshmi to say a few words. Thank you, Professor Kakkar, for your very discerning talk, where the trend is normally to distance by uh, the similarities and comparisons. You brought out the sharing aspect, highlighted kinship and sympathy, pride, wholeness, and especially 
uh, moving towards a reconnection with our own spirit and self through compassion and love. For this, I really um, thank you for bringing out these uh, positive inner potentials that we have within us and uh, which we all need to take forth in our journey as human beings. Um, I also thank Professor Mahalvika Kapoor for sharing this very interesting uh, talk and for this uh, very um, memorial uh, lecture. I thank the NIAS director, Professor Ram Murthy, all the faculty and administration of NIAS, and all of you as an audience for participating today. Thank you.